Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commercial Contract Update for ThinkHouse. Um, I'm David Lowe. I lead our commercial contracts team, drafting and negotiating a wide range of commercial contracts, supply chain, routes to market, procurement, etc. I'm also one of the leaders of ThinkHouse, so I'm sure many of you have seen me before at our physical events. Um, today, I'm going to look at how commercial contract law has changed since March 2019. Um, why March 2019? What's so special about that date? Well, that was the last time I gave this talk at Think House. And so those of you who are collecting uh, David Lowe's Compendium to Contract Law, this will be a neat new chapter to add to the end of your existing notes. We're going to be covering, as I said, commercial contract law. That means I'm going to be focusing on B2B, um, not consumer law, because consumer contract law has its own special features. And it's broadly focused on contracts of the supply of goods and services, although much of what I have to say will be relevant to any contract. And my reference point is what has changed in contract law since March 2019 that makes a difference to how I draft or negotiate contracts, um, or just illustrates a point really well as a reminder of a key basic. So that's the kind of theme that I'm bringing to it. Um, three key areas that we're going to cover. Um, of course, COVID, I can't ignore it, it's here. Now, that hasn't changed contract law as such, but I think it, it's useful just to reflect on how contracts have coped with COVID and some of the key issues coming out of that. I'm also going to talk about the new Insolvency Act. I'm not going to give the general overview. Jasbir partner in our restructuring team has already done a think house session on the new insolvency act providing a, an overview of that which you can is recorded and you can watch i'm just going to concentrate on the impact of the insolvency act on contracts what do you need to actually change in your contracts as a result and then of course finally i am going to do a case law update so those cases key cases that have happened since march 2019 now, just to manage expectations, it's been quite a fallow year for contract cases. Um, when I look back at March 2019, we had the big rock advertising case, the Supreme Court judgment on variation. We also had the Brexit Canary Wharf case, giving some insight on how the courts were going to approach the interaction between Brexit, frustration, and force majeure. Well, we've had nothing of the sorts in the cases since then. So um, we will be covering the cases that have come up but they aren't very substantial. So COVID, um, obviously something that's the front of all of our minds. Um, and I thought it'd be helpful to sort of reflect on what we've learned since March about the impact of COVID in contracts, how contracts have coped with COVID. Now, obviously a key area for that is force majeure. Um, and I'm gonna go through that and particularly reflect on what I think people ought to think about in drafting new contracts. But the other big area, which isn't a change of law as such, but has been this massive shift away from using paper and the issues, practical issues that that has thrown up. Now, force majeure. Um, we've already done a various sessions on force majeure, and those are my briefing note on force majeure and the supply chain for those who want the detail. In that uh, briefing note, I set out step by step how to analyse a contract. So I'm not going to dwell too much on the detail, but I need to obviously go through some of it to allow me to sort of provide some comment on what I think you should do in new contracts. Um, OK, we always recommend that contracts have force majeure. And the reason for that is that English law, um, if you don't have a force majeure clause in your contract, English law just has the concept of frustration which is a very narrow concept and it only applies if your contract becomes impossible to perform. Um, and, you know, famously things like the closing of the Suez Canal, that wasn't frustration because it simply made it more expensive and more difficult to ship goods, but it didn't make it impossible. So we've always advised clients to always include a force majeure clause. One of the interesting things about COVID was actually how many contracts don't have a force majeure clause. Um, obviously, not the contracts I normally would have drafted on and negotiated on, but there are plenty of contracts we discovered that didn't have a force majeure clause, either because they've been drafted by people who are non-lawyers or because one party or the other had purposely decided not to include a force majeure clause. 
for example, standard purchase terms, it's often the case the customer doesn't include a force majeure clause because typically it helps the supplier. Um, what was interesting though was that even though those contracts had no force majeure clause, actually often frustration did help. Um, and I think COVID has been the exception that's proved the, law, the rule. Um, because with COVID, wide-ranging laws were introduced banning certain activities, closing shops, closing theatres, sports grounds and so forth, it was usually easier to demonstrate that there had been a frustrating event. Genuinely, the supplier was impossible for them to perform and therefore the contract had the benefit of frustration. As I said, that's unusual in my experience of force majeure circumstances for it to be so bad to be frustrating. And COVID really is very frustrating, isn't it? Um, both legally and generally, of course. Um, a piece of law that we all had to rediscover, um, and not that we look at very often, uh, mainly because contracts usually aren't frustrated, was the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act 1943. Um, the way that act works is before that act came in, if a contract was frustrated, basically the, the, the contract fell as it was. And so if you had, as a supplier, invested heavily um, in the expectation that you were going to get paid back over a five-year term and the contract was frustrated, well, you couldn't really recover that investment back from the customer. And that was recognised to be unfair. And so the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act then deals with that and deals with the allocation between the parties of the payments and costs basically looking for a fair approach which usually often will end up typically having to go to a court to decide but of course there's very little case law so very little insight into how the courts would approach it so many people were lucky that their contracts that didn't have a force majeure clause still coped because of frustration because covid and the legal measures introduced as a result, COVID had been so wide ranging. But the lesson there is don't rely on that. Always, always include a force majeure clause or at least think about it. You may consciously choose not to put force majeure clause in, but please make sure it's a conscious decision rather than an accident. Now, turning to the contracts that did have force majeure clauses, here is a sort of typical summary of a force majeure clause. There's usually a definition of a force majeure usually referring to an event outside the reasonable control followed by a long list of things that are examples of a force majeure. Typically a force majeure clause have an obligation to notify so the other party knows that you're suffering a force majeure, an obligation to use reasonable endeavours to overcome a force majeure, um, extending relief if performance is impossible or hindered as a result of the force majeure. Some, but not all, force majeure clauses then go on to deal with what happens on payments when a force majeure happens. Does payments continue or not? And many, but not all, also go on to deal with termination. At what point does the force majeure go on for so long that the other party can terminate? Now, with that sort of backdrop, um, how did we work with, with COVID? Well, the measures introduced to deal with COVID were typically a force majeure. Um, there was some issues around the early days of lockdown where there was merely government advice for businesses to perhaps consider shutting down. And that grey area was difficult because if you were legally able to provide services, then there was government advice that maybe you shouldn't or it should be restricted. Is that event outside your reasonable control? Pretty difficult. Uh, but once legal um, restrictions were introduced saying you cannot open a shop, um, you must operate in certain ways, then that definitely became something that was outside the reasonable control of people and the and was a force majeure event. Now, there were some contracts, specifically old, very old contracts or old fashioned contracts, where the force majeure definition wasn't, as I put it here, an event outside reasonable control and then a long list of stuff, but was simply force majeure means and then just listed events, act of God, civil insurrection, etc. Now those contracts do present a problem because very rarely, well, they would never mention COVID specifically and rarely mentioned pandemic. Some of them did mention disease and quarantine, actually, some really old ones, but most of them didn't touch them. Therefore, you were in a 
difficult place of when is the COVID-19 measures, is that a force majeure in this particular contract? Um, so a tip there really is, it, it is unusual in a modern contract to have that, but be very wary of exclusive lists. So, because you can guarantee the event that you haven't anticipated is going to happen, and you then got a question about whether it's force majeure. Use the kind of wording I've just put here, an event outside the reasonable control of the parties, et cetera, including, and then put the list. Don't put just the list. Um, I think probably the key problem that came up with COVID in contracts was not about where it was impossible or difficult for the suppliers to supply, because that was plainly a force majeure, but was where customers didn't want to buy. Um, so, for example, a cleaning contract for an office, if there's nobody in the office, then the customer would probably want no cleaning to be done or little cleaning to be done, because after all, there's no one in the office. So in that circumstance, the customer doesn't want to buy, but that's not a force majeure. Not wanting to do something isn't a force majeure. Just because there's no one in the office because of government laws isn't itself a force majeure. If the cleaning, cleaners can still come legally and come and clean the offices, then it's not force majeure. And so those diff contracts were difficult. Um, and similarly, contracts where suppliers had invested heavily in advance, uh, had high fixed costs, um, and therefore often force majeure clauses weren't dealing with how they continue to be paid on during the force majeure. So the money that arises from force majeure, that was usually where the difficult discussions were going on, partly because the clauses often didn't deal with it. Now, COVID, um, and, and more importantly, furlough, then took the sting out of that. Because the main issue for many people is the labour costs. And if they could somehow get rid of the labour costs by furlough, then the supplier felt a bit happier. And so often we were seeing deals being done. So for example, on cleaning contracts, okay, I'm the cleaning company, I'll agree with you to put all the cleaners on furlough. That takes almost all of the employment costs out of it. And we're just left with a little bit of management time and fixed costs and so forth. So customer, I will carry on charging you, but it'll be a much smaller amount of money. And so that usually worked well. But my worry is, is as furlough unwinds by the end of October, those difficult discussions about money, with those types of contracts are gonna come back because once furlough ends, then the employees are back and need to be paid, or if they can't be used, they need to be made redundant and that comes at a cost. So a cleaning company is gonna say, I can come and clean your office come 1st of November, the cleaners are here ready and waiting, that's gonna cost money. And customers, if they haven't opened their offices or haven't opened offices fully, not gonna to want to pay for that. And then there's gonna be an argument about who pays for the redundancy costs and what happens in that situation. And that will require looking at the detail of the contract. What does it say about termination? What does it say about costs? Um, there has been, a, I've noted, a rush to add pandemic to the lists of the force majeure events. So as I said, an event outside of reasonable control, including act of God, riots, civil insurrection, people are now adding the word pandemic. Frankly, I don't think that makes much difference. Um, if you've drafted the way I suggested it so that it's an event outside reasonable control first, then it doesn't really matter what's in the list really, other than giving a bit of a feel for what the kind of things you had in mind. Uh, so the fact that the pandemic is there or not makes little difference. There is no harm putting the pandemic in, um, but equally I, I don't think it's really worth your while going back and rewriting all your existing contracts out the word pandemic in. An issue that is definitely going to come up is around new contracts. Um, Back, if you entered into a contract back in 2019, there is no way that you could reasonably anticipate COVID-19 or indeed the measures to try and deal with it. And so therefore it is obviously a force majeure event. It's obviously something outside the reasonable control of the parties. It's obviously something that cannot be reasonably anticipated. Um, but if you enter into a new contract today, that's no longer the case. You can anticipate this COVID and COVID measures coming up. You can anticipate there will be second, possibly third waves. Um, and therefore, you can't just rely on the force majeure clause in a new contract 
to deal with the impact of COVID. I haven't seen some people simply adding to the list of force majeure events COVID. But the trouble is, if the parties could have reasonably anticipated COVID measures, the courts are probably likely to say it's not a force majeure. Um, and therefore, best advice is to have a standalone clause that deals specifically with disruption caused by COVID measures so that you're upfront and clear about what happens if there is a total shutdown. Um, I think another tip is be clearer on what happens with the money when a force majeure happens, because as we've discovered in the COVID event, it's, it, most clauses didn't really deal with that and that left lots of unanswered questions. Obviously, it's easy if it's a pay-as-you-go contract where, you know, I'll just pay for what I get. That's easy. But if it's not, think about what happens when force majeure happens. Do you still have to pay the fixed cost of the supply, for example, or not? Best to make that clear. And given my observation, the big issue on COVID was about customers um, discovering they no longer wanted to buy, but that wasn't really good enough to be a force majeure. I would suggest any customer should be thinking about how they can introduce flexibility into their contract. Should they have a right to suspend or flex requirements or simply an ability to terminate at will on short notice? Maybe it comes at a cost consequence, but it then gives at least certainty and choices when it happens. So enough of force majeure and proper law. What I wanted to go on to is the shift to going electronic. Um, you know, we all as lawyers paid lip service, didn't we, to electronic signatures and electronic documents before COVID, but we've been forced to have to engage with it because it's just become very difficult and impractical to typically secure a wet ink signature. So, um, and uh, certainly pre-COVID, people were shifting towards um, accepting a wet ink signature that had been scanned in, but fundamentally, a piece of paper would have to be printed off, presented to somebody who signed with a wetting signature, and then it had been scanned in. That was as revolutionary as we as lawyers had tended to get. Yes, there are e-signature systems out there, but they weren't frequently used. Lots of people worrying about whether they were legal, um, and, and so you, you were seeing them perhaps for low-grade contracts, but not substantial contracts. That has all changed has been no choice it's become impractical to print off and get a wetting signature um, and therefore we've seen the rise of systems such as DocuSign and other e-signature products um, to allow for remote signing. So probably a good time to remind ourselves about when e-signatures are legal and when they're not and basically and you may might remember at a think house from I think 12 months ago we covered e-signatures where I explained that under English law um, e-signatures are legal in most forms of contracts and documents. Certainly the kind of contracts I'm talking about, supply of goods and services, they certainly are legal in an English law contract. The problems of e-signatures are in three different areas. One is where foreign law might apply, because I'm obviously talking about English law. I couldn't tell you what the law in South Africa say is on e-signatures. Um, and bear in mind, that isn't just where your contract is subject to a foreign law. It is possible for your English law contract to be impacted by foreign law. If you have an English law contract with a foreign company signing it, then the law of the country of that foreign company will be relevant to judging whether its signature is valid. And so if you have a contract with a non-English law party, that local law might apply and you obviously ideally need to go and seek local legal advice. The second area is property documents. Pre-COVID, the land registry re refused to accept electronic signatures. So whatever the law said about electronic signature didn't really matter because if you couldn't register you, your property at the land registry, it was pointless. And so if you had a property document in a transaction, you couldn't use these signatures. Um, and the final problem was that it's very unclear at law whether a deed which is needed to be witnessed to be executed, whether that witnessing could be done remotely. Is it possible for me to effectively witness somebody signing by watching them sign over, say, a Zoom call? Nobody knows. There is a lot of debate, academic debate. There are ancient cases about 
how people were able to witness a signature by looking through a window and isn't the analogy to a window as zooms etc but it's all speculation nobody knows the law commission in its consultation confirmed that although it hoped that remote witnessing was valid it didn't know and it needed a change in law either by legislation or by a court case to confirm that point and therefore there was a big question mark over deeds and witnessing so how have things changed there have been some changes obviously more generally the world has just shifted decided to take the risk of e-signatures because it just has to get on with it and to stop worrying and faffing around with paper documents um, and so therefore i would suggest if you haven't yet come across these signatures on any of your contracts i predict you will within the next six months have one of yours where the other party will propose using docusign or some kind of e-signature platform the land registry has changed its rules it's now willing to accept electronic signatures there's then a whole load of detailed rules about exactly when it will and what format and for how and so forth therefore if you've got a property document then you should get expert property legal advice on whether it's possible to sign it with an electronic signature in order for it to be registered and how you do that but in principle it's possible now but we're still not clear on deeds and witnessing so there is still a big question mark out there that if you have a deed that is executed and needs to be witnessed whether it can be witnessed remotely might be maybe but do you really want to be the test case to find out uh, so my suggestion there is that firstly try and avoid a deed that needs witnessing does it need to be a deed at all can you just stick a quid and give it some consideration make it a normal contract or if it does have to be a deed can you find an alternative way of executing it for example if it's been executed by a company then two signatures from two directors is sufficient you don't don't need a witness then um, and so just sidestep the whole issue if it does need to be witnessed then you need to make sure you've got some evidence that uh, it's been physically witnessed maybe it's just a picture a selfie of the wit of the witness and the signatory together in the room as they sign it of course practicing social distancing um, that would at least help because there is a risk that one day somebody might challenge you if you've electronically witnessed as to whether it was a valid um, witnessing and who knows where that case would go i'd like to think that somehow or other we're going to get over this issue in the in near future because it's just a, an irritating um, archaic issue but right now i can't guarantee to you that a remotely witnessed deed is valid. Obviously, part of going electronic is not just about e-signatures. Um, I've started to see a shift of people in contracts and the notices clause to considering using emails. They're obviously normally in the contract, somewhere back in the small print and the boilerplate at the back, it will talk about how contractual notices can be given by personal delivery, which means courier whether it can go by first class post or register post or something like that it might even mention fax and um, usually almost all contracts i typically see emails aren't possible but i have seen a shift over the last six months people started to seriously considering including email notices in and just grasping the nettle and recognizing they need to do that so i think email notices and contracts are coming i'm seeing our i a significant minority of new contracts i'm drafting now has it in and i think that will probably grow to a majority over the next 12 months or so what do you need to think about if you're going to go with email signatures well firstly you need to think about internal authority levels on people giving contractual notices one of the nice things of having to be hard copy letter notices with wetting signatures is it usually made the person signing it a pause for thought should i be signing this should i be sending it or should i be actually getting a director to authorize me to do that because this is obviously a big cheese moment but with emails people sort of seem to disengage any kind of restraint and just email out and say all kinds of things by email which they may then live to regret so reminding people of the authority levels and what they ought to think about before issuing a contractual notice is, is a really important part of this um, you need to obviously have an email inbox but it shouldn't be that of an individual it shouldn't be david.low at gowlingwlg.com because if i leave gowling nobody's going to check my email inbox at least not after a couple of months and then if a contractual notice arrives 
being validly served, but I didn't, but the person receiving didn't even know it arrived. So don't um, do it to an individual. Have something like cosec at dowlingwlg.com and put in place procedures to check the email inbox. Um, make sure that twice a day somebody's checking it and there's some record kept that that's done. Think about file sizes as well, because there's no point um, agreeing for email notices if the, the firewall on your systems is too um, restrictive. Consider whether you want a hard copy to be served as well. Emails are fine as long as you send me a copy by, by the post. Um, I hesitate to that because it sort of feels bonkers, but it might be a step that can just help you transition over to this. And um, final plea, please, please stop using faxes. Um, well, none of you use faxes, but please stop using fax notice clauses. Many contracts I see, see still have fax as a possible means of notice. And that's just gonna cause a risk for you. Somebody might send you a fax and you don't even know, and therefore you've been validly served with a contractual notice. So just go through your, con your standard templates and delete fax. The other brief observation, Electronic documents, um, the, um, with big transactions, you know, big outsourcing transactions, with large schedules, with pricing schedules, and schedules of pictures showing sites, and um, complicated tables and so forth. The, usually, in reality, although each element of that contract would be stored electronically, actually it was a hybrid document. Because what I would do is I would print off all those different components, maybe five or six different documents, Excel spreadsheet, pictures and so forth, and then stick it all together so it looks like one single document. And as a paper document, no one's none the wiser that there is actually lots of different documents. In. Now in COVID world where you know, printing off voluminous documents and sticking it all together has become a lot harder, we have a choice. We either circulate final documents which are a, a patchwork of lots of different documents, Word documents, Excel documents and so forth, or you can merge it all into one PDF. The problem with doing the merging into PDF as I discover frequently now is it takes a long time to do properly because trying to deal with all the formatting issues is painful. Um, and then once you've done it, it's quite difficult to change and you have to restart the whole process. So completely electronic documents, I don't think actually we're quite there yet for making them really easy, but we we need to. And of course, it's going to be a precursor to you know, smart contracts where they automatically runs the contract and measures the service levels and charges people automatically. Well, to achieve that, you need a single electronic document. Turning now to the um, new Insolvency Act, Jasper, as I mentioned, she's provided an overview of what this act is, why it's come into force, and the key changes in it. I'm not going to go into any of that at all. You, uh, I do strongly recommend you uh, acquaint yourself with her talk uh, because it's a really useful scene setter. I'm just going to concentrate on the two areas where it impacts on contract. Um, there are two areas. One is there's a new type of insolvency called moratorium and the second is around termination. So dealing with the first issue, moratoriums, what this means is that in your contracts where you've got a long list of insolvency events, you know, administration, um, liquidation, all that kind of stuff, you need to add moratorium in there as well, because otherwise somebody could go into a moratorium and from your point of view be insolvent, but your contract may not allow you to do anything about that. So update your definitions of insolvency events to include moratorium. The biggie though for us with contracts is that if a customer goes insolvent, the supplier will no longer be able to terminate a contract for goods or services. This is a concept that's been around a long time in many countries around the world. You know, a lot of countries around Europe have this concept, but we in the UK have not had this concept before. We in the UK have had it. If you put in your contract, I can terminate if you've become insolvent, then that works and that has changed. Now, key issues here. This is about customer insolvency, not supplier insolvency. If I'm a customer and my supplier goes bust, this isn't relevant. You don't need to worry about this. This is only relevant where a customer goes bust and you're a supplier. It's also only relevant for contracts to supply of goods and services. So it doesn't apply, for example, to leases um, of, of property. Um, 
there, and there are certain exemptions from goods and services such as finance contracts. So what it means is the supplier cannot terminate once the customer is insolvent. The law also says that if the supplier had the right to terminate, doesn't exercise it, the customer goes bust, the supplier cannot then terminate post-insolvency for the pre-insolvency breach. So if a customer has failed to pay you and is therefore in breach of contract and you haven't got around to terminating the contract, then they go bust. You can't then terminate because um, the law says you can't. And in the notes underneath these slides, you'll see there are extracts from the legislation setting out the exact words. The other difficult thing is a supplier cannot do any other thing due to customer insolvency. And nobody knows what that any other thing really means. Does that mean that a supplier uh, can't change their behavior, the way in which they manage the contract? Does that mean that if the customer breaches the contract, um, you know, wrongly refuses to accept delivery, for example, that the supplier can or can't terminate? Is that due to the customer insolvency? Lots of big questions there. Um, you can terminate if you have the consent of the company or the insolvency office holder. Well, they're only going to give you that consent if they want to, if it suits them. Or you can go and get the court to agree to you being able to terminate. Um, and that would require a continuation of contract would cause supplier hardship. And again, we don't know just what supplier hardship means until we've had some case law. We've got no idea. Um, bear in mind payment before the insolvency um, then the money owed to you by the customer well that just you just become a creditor no change there you um, once the customer becomes insolvent um, the customer you'll get so many pence in the pound um, once the insolvency is sorted out so no change to that um, however if you're supplying post insolvency then it's, it's complicated and you'll see in the notes an explanation of how it works but Basically, the expectation is that you should get paid for post-insolvency deliveries. So it's not the end of the world with your contract not being terminated, because at least as it carries on, you'll get paid for the post-insolvency. The challenge is it means that you can't refuse to supply until you get paid for the pre-insolvency money, and which is what used to happen. And that can no longer happen. So the tables have shifted in favour of the customer and the insolvent customer. Um, lots of area for dispute in this. That exemption for finance insurance, just exactly what does that mean? You know, for example, commodity contracts with maybe a floating charge in it, does, is that possibly a derivative? Can you argue that to get it into an exemption so that you can terminate it? Uh, a supplier terminating post-insolvency for something not to do with insolvency um i don't know the the customer is in breach of contract because it fails to do certain things to what extent can the supplier do that given that it cannot do any other thing relating to the insolvency um what happens if a supplier changes behavior and how it manages the contract is that allowed or not what about call off contracts where there's a framework that says you can place orders and I, the supplier, have to accept um, unless I've got a good reason not to? What happens if the supplier does refuse to accept the call off? Um, what, what about call offs where the supplier has the absolute discretion to accept or not? Does it have to accept call offs post insolvency? We don't know, and that's going to require litigation. And then, of course, contracts aren't simply contracts for goods and services. I deal with many complicated contract structures where there's a more collaborative arrangement, where there's goods going back and forth, or the guarantees and so forth. How do those work in this situation, which none of us actually know? And again, unfortunately, going to have to wait for some litigation. So, what do I suggest? Um, do keep your insolvency for termination clause in your contract. They might just work, the law might change. Um, litigation might come along, they might just work. So there's no harm in it being there. But my suggestion is you don't change your boilerplate, just leave the insolvency clause in there. Do update the definition of insolvency event to refer to moratorium. And also have a review of the clause. Does it include some of the sort of pre-insolvency triggers? 
um, because before the customers become formally insolvent, you are entitled to terminate. So if you've got a trigger for pre-formal insolvency, then you might be able to get out of it if you act quickly. Um, and of course, you must monitor the credit risk and, and act quickly. Um, the, um, you, of course, already be monitoring credit risk, but now it's even more important, and it's even more important that you at least allow yourself to act quickly. We're also seeing in public sector contracts following Carillion, the introduce of sort of financial monitoring clauses where the customer, well, in public sector, where the supplier has to tell the government if it's got any problems going on. Um, perhaps we'll start seeing those leaking into big set piece contracts um, where suppliers might be worried about the customer going bust and want some kind of financial monitoring. Now I'm going to turn to case law update. Talked about COVID, force majeure, electronic documents, electronic signatures. We've talked about the Insolvency Act. And now we're in the final act, which is the case law update. And as I mentioned, there aren't too many cases. The law hasn't radically changed in the last 18 months. Um, so you can rest assured that your contracts and your way of thinking that you've developed over your years of experience has not been significantly altered by cases over the last 18 months. So I'm going to start first with economic duress, not least because we're starting to see in this sort of recessionary kind of times a significant rise in this. This is where typically a, a supplier says, I'm obliged to supply you. I've got a contract supply, but I'm going to refuse to supply you unless we double the price because uh, I know you've got nowhere to go. So can we agree to a contract variation, doubling the price? Otherwise, you're not going to get the parts delivered to you tomorrow. And usually this has happened because the supplier is sliding into difficult finances or may have strategically decided they just don't want to be in this sector because it's too risky or whatever. So we are seeing quite a lot of that and it is a really difficult area. Um, the, the law is, is that if it's illegitimate pressure that has led to that, then that um, variation is void. So, so for the other party, if you can show your economic duress after the event, then you might be able to re reverse the contract and get the premium back, etc. What is meant by legitimate pressure? Well, a threat to breach a contract probably is. Not necessarily, and that's where you need to talk to a litigator, but that's a good, a good chance breaching contract knowingly is going to be a legitimate pressure. Pakistan International Airlines was a case about where there was no breach of contract. Pakistan International Airlines was fed up with some agents suing it for commission. So it, it terminated its old travel agency contract and it was allowed to do that under its contract, it had a right to terminate if it wanted to. And it introduced new contracts and in the new contracts that require the agents to waive their rights to commission. Um, and if you didn't sign up to that, then they massively reduced the ticket allocation, which given that Pakistan Airlines is the main airline flying from the UK to Pakistan had a big impact on some travel agents. So they all claimed economic duress. The courts had to decide whether or not Pakistani Airlines had used illegitimate pressure. On the one hand, this didn't look very nice behavior, just unilaterally terminating contracts and introducing these new contracts, waiving the commission claims. But on the other hand, Pakistani Airlines had acted in accordance with the contract. It was allowed to terminate and it is entitled to put in contracts broadly wherever it wants. The High Court thought it was illegitimate pressure, pointing to the lack of choice for the agents. There was no other big Pakistani airline they could switch to. However, the Court of Appeal disagreed. The Court of Appeal said, this might not be very nice behavior, but it isn't illegitimate. Um, there's no sign that Pakistani Airlines knew that this was that it wasn't allowed to do this. It is allowed to do it under the contract. And yes, there may well be a monopoly on these flights to Pakistan, but that's not for the courts to deal with ultimately. So this means that if a party is acted in accordance with the contract, it's less likely to be illegitimate pressure, less likely to be economic duress. Turning now to remoteness, there's been a Big case in the Privy Council. Privy Council is the uh, non-UK Supreme Court for Commonwealth jurisdictions and others, and is attended by Supreme Court judges. So it's the equivalent of the Supreme Court. It's a case on remoteness about where do you draw the line on damages on a breach of contract. 
design and build contract of a water reclamation plant was contract one, and there was then a follow on contract to operate and manage it for 12 years. British Virgin Islands breached the contract. And so the GWA, the supplier, was suing them for damages and wants to claim for damages for the loss of profit on contract one, which had been breached and wrongly terminated. But he also wanted damages for the follow on contract. Could it claim those damages? Supreme Court went back to basics, Hadley Baxendale, you know, and said, you know, is it in the reasonable contemplation of the parties? And after reviewing all the various case law and considering the facts, it concluded that it was in the reasonable um, contemplation of the parties. That if the first contract was breached and wrongly terminated, then the consequence would be a loss of profit for the second contract as well. So no surprises in that. Um, ultimately, remoteness is a fact-based assessment, but the case is a really useful summary of all the basic principles. So if you're needing to get into it, I really recommend it as a good read. Good faith. So we've been monitoring the good faith clauses for some years now. You'll recall that we had in the Yam Sen case, Justice Legger introducing the concept of the potential to imply into a contract a duty to use good faith. Big debate about whether every contract has a, an implied duty to use good faith or only some and what you can do about it. And so we've been monitoring that for some time. Most cases since then have considered it and then decided that in their particular contract there is no implied duty to use good faith. But there has been a couple of cases, um, typically if it's Justice Leggett is the judge on it, um, where the court have implied a duty to use good faith. So considerable uncertainty at the moment about when good faith gets implied and what it means. So we had last year debates in the post office, a bunch of sub postmasters suing the post office to do with a failed accounting system. And the courts were asked to consider whether there was an implied duty to use good faith. The judge in that case decided that as it is a relational contract, relational contract is a word lifted from Justice Leggett and Yan saying that this contract therefore had an implied duty to use good faith. And the judge said there are nine factors to support that implied duty. And here are five of them. And here is the remaining four of them. So there's quite a few of them and you know, no express term, long term, and then loads of sort of whiffly waffly words about collaboration and trust and confidence and all that kind of stuff. So it's not that helpful to actually tell you whether or not your contract has an implied duty of good faith or not. It certainly encourages though, if your contract is a sort of collaborative, a joint venture certainly, then there's a high risk that you've got an implied duty to use good faith. Now you can expressly exclude it, um, but of course, that's quite a difficult call to put in your contract and express exclusion of the duty to use good faith. That doesn't exactly start off the relationship the right way. Um, so you probably won't do that. And you'll probably cross your fingers and worry about it. Should there ever be any litigation and worry about what good faith means then? The, um, you know, there is that debate about what is good faith. Um, is it, it's more than honesty. Um, the judge said not to behave in a way that would be regarded as commercially unacceptable by reasonable and honest people, whatever that means. I see a wide range of behaviours in contracts and disputes, um, so I think it's difficult to work out what is commercially acceptable by reasonable and honest people. We wait to see, is this just an outlier case that we can all ignore, or are we going to see more good faith cases? We're conscious that uh, Justice Leggett is now a Supreme Court judge, and so it wouldn't surprise me that when he has the opportunity is that he may well introduce the concept of good faith in a Supreme Court judgment, and hopefully at that point we'll get a bit more clarity. Other big area that we touched on a few years ago was the MacDessie case on penalties, which reviewed the law and significantly changed the law on penalties. That old law genuine pre-estimate of loss was decided not to be necessarily required for something to be an enforceable obligation. You shouldn't call them penalties, but if you call them something else and it's not totally outrageous, then it will almost certainly be enforceable. And we've been watching the cases since then. Um, we reviewed them last year in 19, 2019, very few cases where it was found to be 
unenforceable. Most cases were enforceable. Here are three more cases where in each one, the courts have decided that the obligation is enforceable. Um, and they're quite a range, as you can see, liquidate damages, uh, high interest rates, bad lever provisions. So quite a good cross section of all the typical different ways in which you see penalty clauses and in all of them, the court said they're enforceable. So broadly, as long as you are sensible, you can do what you want. Finally, an issue close to my heart, Incoterms 2020, I'm sure you've heard me go on about this, and we have got a series of podcasts and supporting materials, should you be uh, as interested in Incoterms as I am. Um, many of you will remember that I was the global co-chair of the drafting group for Incoterms 2020. Incoterms 2020 deal with shipping terms like FOB, FCA free carry, delivered duty paid. They were reviewed, they had their 10 year review and they were published in January 2020. There is no radical change, but there is changes in the detail and we are seeing people starting to shift over to them. So it's a good time to review your usage of Inco terms. Um, and I've provided in the notes below the slides all of the various links to the materials we've got you are interested in that. And I su suggest that actually now is also a really good time to review your INCO terms and your international freight delivery terms because of Brexit looming. Um, it looks likely we're going to have a hard or no deal Brexit, in which case understanding exactly who has responsibility for what crossing the UK border and the other countries border is going to be really important. And we are seeing people coming to us with difficult issues around responsibility for importer record, customs, VAT, which would, would which if you use an INCO term would be largely resolved, so do review that. So it's been very good talking to you all this time. I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing you all physically in our offices for a physical event, um, but I hope in the meantime this has been a useful commercial contract summary. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.